recording. And we'll throw, um, Devin will just keep throwing the chat in a couple more times as more folks join us so everyone can see what our plan of action is for the day. But let me, uh, let me just welcome everyone back. This is our third meeting of the Equity Advisory Council and our second um, open public meeting. The first meeting we had was um, just for the council itself to get a chance to know each other and uh, do some pre-work on some, on some items we had for them. Um, so do want to welcome everyone. If I've not had a chance to meet you, my name is Scott Cheney. I'm the CEO here at Prudential Engine. Um, and let me let uh, Kristen Moore introduce herself. Hi, good afternoon, Kristen Moore. And I work with ATM Strategist, and we have the fortunate opportunity to be supporting Credential Engine, um, leading experts in equity. And I've just been an absolute wonder to work with. Um, so really thank Kristen and her colleague, Laura and HCM for joining us on this, on this journey. Um, so we have in the chat um, a link to the agenda. Um, our, our work, uh, today is really going to uh, focus on the actual data elements uh, around credentials and competencies and inputs and outcomes of credentials, um, things we need to really be able to focus on uh, in order to be able to understand whether pathways and transfer um, are uh, providing equitable access, whether they're res resulting in equitable outcomes, what does that even mean? Um, so we're really going to do a lot of work today on thinking about terms and data elements uh, related to those, and that can be published using the Credential Transparency Description Language um, and made available through the registry. Uh, we'll recap quickly here to start some of the work to date. Um, Kristen will provide just an update on the um, definition of equity that the Council um, is settling on and will be using in the uh, in this work going forward. Um, I'll do a quick and you know, very quick overview of some of the um, terms that we have around pathways and transfer uh, related uh, terms that are in the registry or in CTDL now. And it'll be a, a little bit of a recap of what Jeannie Kitchens did in our second meeting, but uh, an expanded version to really look at uh, what's possible in terms of having data elements related to those. Um, and then we're gonna open it up just you know, the first part there is going to give you an idea of what we cover already and then we're going to open it up and invite your input um, we have a mirror board that we've um, set up that we'll give you access to um, but it doesn't have to be through a mirror board we can take input in the chat we can take it on email we'll take it on phone calls uh, we'll take any input you have in any way that you're comfortable um, so that we can really get your insights into what kind of data elements we need to, to have available um, and then we'll do a quick wrap up and look forward to the next meeting, which is in September. Uh, so just any, any questions about what our plan of action is for today? And hopefully everyone is able to access that agenda. Okay. Um, and before we move on just to the recap, uh, we'll throw in the, the link to the council member bios, just a quick reminder um, ordinarily, Credential Engine does its work through um, just completely open uh, community-based conversations and, and input from anyone who wants to in the world. Uh, we're continuing that on this council um, work around equity, but we also decided that it was important to have a set of experts um, around equity to be part of this work throughout its entirety. Um, and to really be asked to think uniquely about their understanding of equity and, and what they can contribute to this work. So we're doing a bit of a blended model uh, on this one. And Devin, I think, is throwing into the chat the link to the bios for the um, actual council members so that everyone can see um, who, is, who is on the council um, and you're welcome to reach out and, and have a conversation, um, provide your input to them, uh, or just or just weigh in with us, but wanted to share that with you as well. And Kristen, anything you want to add to that, or any of the council members, or anyone on the call who wants to just um, share any thoughts before we kind of dive in here? 
No, I think as we go, people should feel comfortable using both um, the hand raising to be able to speak or the chat. We'll be using both as we're looking forward to another engaging conversation. Excellent. Okay, so just a quick recap um, of the work to date so everyone is on the same page. Uh, as I said, the first meeting of the, the council was a chance for them just to get to know each other. Um, not everyone had met. Uh, we began to do just some unpacking about uh, individual experience around equity, what their perspectives on, on equity was. Uh, we did an overview of Credential Engine um, and just who we are and, and the work that we do so that everyone had a, a level set on that. Um, and then we began to uh, work on a definition of equity. That work actually started before the first meeting. Um, Kristen did some survey work with the members um, and then proposed a, a working definition that, uh, that we've been working on from that first meeting um, between the first and second meeting and then spent the first part of the second meeting um, in a closed session with the council to bring that uh, definition to um, some finality and uh, Kristen will share that uh, with you all in just a second and walk you through it and see if there's any questions on that. And, and we hope to then have that be the, the definition that we move forward with. And as I said, in the last um, part of last meeting, uh, we asked Jeannie Kitchens, who is our chief technology services officer to provide just an overview about how Credential Engine thinks about and works on and is able to define and display information about pathways and transfer uh, so that we began to understand when we're talking about data points, it's data points in relation to what. Um, so that deck uh, was made available. We can post that again um, in, the, in the chat for people that didn't see it. Like I said, what I'm gonna go through today covers um, some of that again, and I think would be a, a good refresher for people and then where we're going from here is today, like I said, is really about trying to have your input on what it is people, students, workers, employers, educators, policymakers need to know about pathways and transfer and recognition of prior learning in order to be able to make a determination. Are those meeting the definition of equity that, that we'll lay out? Um, so that's the focus of today. And then we want to take that input and begin to build a, an explicit recommendation for any organization that is publishing credential and competency information to Credential Engine and using the Credential Transparency Description Language. And in fact, even beyond that, if you choose not to work with us out there, and yet you still are making information about credentials public in any way you are, what is it you need to be sharing in order to, to help people understand whether what you're involved with, whether what you're providing is in fact equitable. Um, so we'll be moving toward that first recommendation uh, in the next meeting and asking for people's input um, in, into that set of recommendations. And then the meetings after that are gonna turn from what information is it we need to have be publicly available to how does that information then get used in the service of actually helping students and workers and learners be able to make more informed decisions about whether a particular pathway or a transfer opportunity is gonna lead them to equitable opportunity and equitable outcomes. Um, so we'll be working on the, on the use side of the, the data um, in the fifth and sixth meetings. Um, and if we find that we need a, a seventh meeting, we can book that, but we're not gonna go beyond seven meetings, um, we don't think for this body of work. If we, if we do need to do more, we'll recharter the organization, the, the work and, and come back at it. Um, and so to that end, I'm gonna ask Devin to also throw into the chat, a link to the charter for, um, for the council and uh, invite anyone to just review and ask questions about the charter um, but also going to use that opportunity to turn it over to Kristen um, to talk about the equity definition, which you'll also find in the charter, um, but, but uh, we can uh, pull up here for you as well. Great. So again, feel free to chime in with any questions um, or clarity that might be needed. I want to um, replace in the chat um, as Scott said, um, Devin put the charter. I'll also directly put the link to the definition 
as well as share my screen um, just for those that might want to view it that way. Um, hopefully, y'all are able to see the definition. And as Scott mentioned, wanted to thank the charter members for their work and their feedback, as this really does reflect our multiple conversations um, to identify a North Star. We know equity can often be a buzzword, so we wanted to be really clear on what we meant by equity. And so the things highlighted in red really came out of our last discussion, where we really wanted to put an emphasis um, on certain areas such as ableism, um, and that being another area of focus. We also changed the word intersectionality to intersection, as that's more applicable to this setting of how we're defining equity. And then we also really wanted to hone in on equity isn't just about identifying who we need to serve, but it's about committing towards greater outcomes um, and making sure it's a process that we're continuing to revisit and evaluate to ensure we're not having unintended consequences but we're still meeting the mark that we've identified for ourselves. Um, you also should be able to see the definition that we do explicitly call out racial equity. Um, we talk about moving away from the status quo. What we're not trying to do is create structures within what, what where society currently is, but whether we wanna to move towards an idealistic society where equity is actually achieved, which is disrupting the status quo. Um, so again, wanna thank all of you for your work and your comments um, in order to make this definition be so robust. But wanna pause here to get reflections um, from of course the council members, but also others to see if this aligns with the many conversations um, or, or if there's anything else kind of glaring that you think needs to be called out. Okay. Well, I think silent Scott is a good thing. Um, of course, we're always open to a reentative process. So take some time to digest this. If more things arise, please feel free to share that feedback with us and we'll be sure to then bring it back to the council um, and update the, the um, definition as needed to reflect the conversations that we're having. Excellent. Um, thank you, Kristen and uh, the, the copy that Kristen just showed you had those red highlights so you could see the changes that had been made in the last council meeting. What's in the charter um, just is the final version that, that just moves those from red into, into um, black text. So it's all just one um, color and you can see that in the, the charter as, the, as that final definition, unless we, you know, anything else, but uh, based on the last conversation we had with the council, um, we think that that will be the definition moving forward. Okay. Um, any other input, any questions at this point before I just do a, a quick um, a quick share of my screen and, and walk through some of the, uh, excuse me, reminder of the CTDL and the terms related to pathways and transfer. Um, let me just pause for a second and see if folks have anything they want to share. Okay, then I am going to share my screen. It's always a little questionable whether I'm able to share my screen accurately. And of course, it's telling me that I need to open my system preferences. So I must have had a reset of <laughs> Zoom at some point. Is my is my screen sharing now? We don't see it yet. We don't see it yet. Awesome. I love it when this happens, when you're going live. <laughs> Today, um, Zoom, there was a global Zoom outage on Tuesday. Tuesday so. morning, right in the middle of our board meeting, Scott. So <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that it's it's finally finally working today. Well, let's not let's not say that too quickly because so far I'm not able to get. Um, uh, hey, Devin, is is Zoom working for you? Are you able to share the the slide deck? I can definitely try to. Okay, we'll we'll see if. Stefan's system is cooperating more than my system right now. Okay. We've all been there for sure. Yes, we have. All right. Two and a half years in. 
we've all had our share. Look at that. All Can right. everyone see? We're okay. good? Okay, love to see it. All right, all right. I'm ready. So, all right. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to have to, um, we're, we're going to finagle this a little bit because I'm going to jump off of this screen and, and I'll see if we can just have you, Devin, um, pull up a few things as we go here. So uh, appreciate everyone's patience. We're going to make this work. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and you can just go beyond that too. Um, I think we put those in there just because we feel like we have to have a highly structured um, uh, slide deck. So just as a reminder to people, um, and hopefully all of our, our great state partners, Allison and Marty from our, our state publishing partners and the folks who were on last time will have seen this before, but in case you are new to, to this conversation and new to us, um, a reminder that uh, really the core of Credential Engine is hosting and maintaining and, and really uh, encouraging the adoption and use of a set of schema to ensure that information about credentials and competencies and all of these related um, uh, elements are made fully transparent as linked open data. We do that through three different schema, the Credential Transparency Description Language or the CTDL um, that covers almost everything um, except for competencies, which are uh, described through the CTDL ASN. Um, and then we also have a schema for quantitative data which is really uh, earnings and employment outcomes or pass rates or um, completion rates, uh, those kind of things, which are, which are really um, less descriptive and more quantitative. So between the three of those, uh, we cover over 800 different terms related to the ecosystem of uh, credentials and providers and competencies and pathways and transfer and costs and quality and um, outcomes and, and all sorts of other things. And you can just see some of the types of categories um, that we cover here. And you can go on, Devin. Just a little bit more user-friendly view um, than, than that more uh, confusing one previously. Uh, these are, again, some of the types of things that are, are covered in the, in the CTDL family of schema. We can go on. I really am gonna try and just get us to the actual your input um, faster this time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Um, sometimes those, those boxes and those arrows and circles are feeling like they're just a little esoteric. Um, and so I wanted to provide you with just a glimpse of what is actually in the registry today. So we actually have information from around 1700 different organizations that provide or issue, own issue or provide credentials of some type or competency frameworks. Um, that represents right now about 37,500 credentials um, as of a couple hours ago. Uh, I should just say in, in reference for everyone, a reminder that we have estimated that there are just under a million unique credentials available in the United States. So we've got a ways to go, but we are um, at this point still the most comprehensive uh, uh, open data registry um, and open data system uh, anywhere because we also not just have credentials, we've got 950 or so. Oh, thank you. Um, Scarlett just put an update in the, um, in the publisher that we're now up to about 38,000. Um, we have competency frameworks, about 950, uh, that represent about 50,000 unique competencies. Um, we've had about 5,800 outcome data points published to the registry. We'll show you some of those uh, in just a second. Uh, learning opportunities, um, really courses or, or curriculum, the actual individual elements that make up a, a credential and that you, you go through in order to earn the credential. Information about 630 assessments, really just beginning to publish uh, pathways. So putting all of those credentials and competencies and outcomes together into pathways. Uh, transfer value, and our, our friends in Kansas are gonna be publishing a lot of transfer values from Kansas. Uh, here over the next few months. Um, so we're excited about that. And then just to give you an idea, we're working very closely uh, with the state of Texas and Iowa, Wisconsin, Florida, um, who are all gonna be publishing in large part for the first time. And that'll bring in tens of thousands of additional credentials. Uh, Kansas is publishing uh, transfer values soon. Indiana is gonna be publishing 
um, some pathway and outcome data um, that they've done a lot already, but there's more coming. So this is just going to get richer, richer and richer here. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, Devin. Um, and just to give you an example about what it looks like. So it's, again, moving from the theoretical to some of those numbers to this is what one of the examples looks like when it's seen in the credential finder. Um, and we're going to come back to this one because I want to point out some things that are on here um, in, in more detail in just a little bit. But that um, uh, link in the in the note here is live and you can go to it. And, and like I said, we're gonna to go to that um, shortly. Okay, Devin. All right, so we can move on. So just as a reminder, um, the, the definition and, and the goal of the work here today is to ensure that we have in the CTDL, not just those 800 terms, but if we need to add terms in order to be able to provide information and share information about pathways and transfer that gets us to this de definition of equity, that's the goal of this council, is to you know, get it to 840 terms, if that's what we need, in order to be able to have all that information come forward. We may find that we don't need to add many terms, that we have all of them there. We may find that we're going to have to add a lot more. Um, so that's, that's the work of the council here. Okay, so uh, also just a reminder that when we think about pathways, um, pathways are made up of lots of different elements that can be published to the registry. So components that make up a pathway, it'll be information about the provider, the credential itself, the competencies that are there, any assessments that have to be taken along the pathway in order to advance yourself. So you know, we, we think about pathways as all of those different pieces and oftentimes there are constraints involved with those pathways. You can't take this next thing until you actually pass a test or you have to take so many credit hours or you have to complete this credential before you move to the next one. Um, so lots of different um, elements that make up a pathway in, in the work that we do. Okay. Um, again, just to give you, and this is really a, just to kind of um, prime the pump for you, the kind of things that we have now and that you may look at and say, okay, you have information about um, the competencies or the extracurriculars. We need to know more about an extracurricular, not just that it's required, but who provides it? When is it available? Um, is there a cost for that extracurricular? Is it available to, in, in a way that allows all students who want to be on a pathway to be able to get to that extracurricular? Is it a required extracurricular or is it, is it optional? So it's, it's those kind of things that we're going to be asking you to help us think through um, and, and to make sure that we have as rich of information as possible. And as we get into this, we're not going to ask you to be constrained necessarily by how we capture something already. We want you to be able to say, this is what we need to know about it. And then we can go back and look to see where we need to make adjustments. So we're just trying to get you thinking about the kinds of things that um, are currently in and that we might need to know more about. And was someone trying to, to add something there? I just want to make sure I don't cut anyone off. OK, we can go on to the next slide, Devin. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I talked about this basically. So it, this, this walks us through all the different components that are in um, that are in a pathway and building them together to be able to display what that full pathway is. Okay, Devin. Um, so what allows us to do is to take all the information that is related to these various aspects of credentials and, and ecosystems and pathways and put them into what's on this next slide. I gotta commend Devin for trying to follow my train of thought on you know, a, a presentation that she had not really um, had, to, had to do this before. So then the next slide, Devin, you know, into an organized structure that will be able to show that you've got um, courses or in this case, courses. Um, I didn't check my spelling closely enough. Um, at the same time, you're taking extra you know, co-curriculars that there might be supports around. And that supports could be counseling. It could be course selection. It could be um, you know, other supports that help an individual be able to 
stay engaged fully in that pathway and successfully complete it. Um, I won't walk through every one of these things here, but you get the idea that we're trying to think about what are all those elements that, that make up the, a successful and equitable pathway. Okay. Um, and then just quickly also on, on transfer value, we've done a lot of work on transfer value um, and we'll, we'll make sure that we have this um, deck available uh, in just a second in the, in the um, chat. So you can click on some of these live links to see what the transfer value profile are and how we describe transfer value in the, the CTDL handbook. Um, but if we go to the next slide, uh, just some of the, the types of things that we're thinking about. Transfer value is a little, a little more straightforward, um, at least in, in our work on it so far. Uh, essentially, uh, a training provider who is offering a credential and then there is someone who is reviewing it and, and making a determination about what value of that uh, credential would be from that provider and, and what the recommended transfer value profile should be. Uh, it might be in credit hours, it might be in time hours, uh, or, or excuse me, credit units or in hour units. Um, it might be good only for a certain period of time. It might be good only if it transfers from one provider to another. Um, but the, again, those are the kind of things that we'll be looking for to understand um, where's the next level of depth we need to have in the CTDL to be able to accurately describe transfer to understand um, its equity. Okay, um, and then just an example, which again, we'll let you go, go look at um, for yourself in the credential finder, which is a, a, uh, an example of how transfer looks in the registry itself. All right, so Devin, this is where it's gonna get a little tricky for you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, thank you for being able to continue to share your screen. So let's just take a look quickly at some of the um, types of outcome data um, and, and inputs that are in the registry now. So back to that AS nursing um, example, uh, you can see uh, as I uh, pulled it up into a little bit more of a, of a larger font here, just that there's uh, a circled for outcome data. And Devin, I'm gonna ask you, and we're gonna hope this works, to click on the actual link to the AS in nursing. Um, and we're gonna pull that up. This is both Scott and Devin trying to coordinate their presentation in real time using live technology and links to the finder. And I know the finder was a little slow earlier, so here we go. Okay, so if you just scroll down um, and click on the outcome data external box. Yep. So what Indiana has done, and, I, and I'm not sure, I think Ken Sauer was gonna try and be on the call today too and could probably walk you through a little bit more. What Indiana has done um, in, in a lot of their credentials is to publish really rich information about particular credentials. And in this case, um, they have published it uh, according to the campus. If you don't know Ivy Tech, it's one statewide system, but with multiple campuses. So they've published outcome data um, by different campuses. The beauty about this is that you're not looking at just one statewide outcome for a particular credential. You can understand, are there different outcomes in different parts of the state? And depending on what campus you went through to get this AS in nursing. So if you, we're just gonna stay on the Anderson campus for a second and scroll down for a second, Devin, uh, keep going. So here you can see that I'm just up a smidge there. So this data is coming to us from, um, oh, I'm sorry, up a little bit more. Yeah, here we go. So the data is being sent to the registry, not by Ivy Tech itself. In this case, this data is coming from the Indiana State Board of Nursing. So we have a third party administrative data unit that is, that is collecting this information and, and publishing it too. So now you can scroll down for me, Devin, to the, yep, uh, keep going. Um, there we go. So for the Anderson campus, the, the state has published information um, that between 2018 or in the year 2018, um, the pass rate at the bottom was 75%. Um, that was 36 people out of a total of 48. And then if you click on the 2019 tab, Devin, just right next to it. Yep. You can see that in that particular year, 
um, it was 71%. And in 2020, it was 66%. All information about the outcomes of this particular um, uh, experience in the AS and nursing in a particular year that may in some way help us understand, you know, the effectiveness of a particular pathway if part of the outcome of the pathway is to have successful pass rates to earn this credential and to, and to get that license so that you can actually go practice. So no judgment about the, you know, Anderson campus or India or Ivy Tech or this particular credential, but just again, to give you an idea about the type of information that is being published um, and is available or can be published using CTDL in the registry. Okay, you can click out of that, Devin, and then um, you can go back to the slide deck for me. Thank you very much. Um, let me just stop there and see if there's any questions that people have just about any of that, or if, if Ken Sauer is on, um, if he wanted to say anything else about this particular example. I can look to see if Ken made it today. Okay, um, then we can move on. So let's go to uh, the next example. So here's just another one I wanted to show you. This is um, from Indiana, Indiana, ooh, Illinois Central College. Uh, it's a truck, dri truck driver training program. And I'm obviously late in the week and having trouble talking. Um, and this particular um, set of outcome data is gonna be a little different. So I'm gonna have um, Devin click on this one for me. So as when we're talking about nursing and, and nursing licenses, there's an interest in knowing pass rates. So how, how successfully will a particular program prepare you for and allow you to pass that licensing um, uh, exam? This one, um, we're just gonna scroll down a little bit and click on that outcome data external. And we can scroll down, uh, get finish loading, yep. So this particular one is going to show you that um, if you are uh, looking at outcome data, there were the number of people who are in this. This is WIOA data. This is the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. So this is um, information that came in from Illinois about these credentials that are eligible for the public workforce dollars. Um, and you can see how many people were involved. You can click on that next tab, the training related employment. And you can see that if you went through this and um, training unrelated. So if you went through this and you got a job um, in a non-training related job, but you happened to go through this training, your average wage was $16.96. And if you click on the next tab, the data they're gonna show you is that if you went through the training and you actually got a job in the related field, your average wage was $17.66, so higher. So again, good information to have when you're thinking about a pathway and helping people effectively finish that pathway and go into a job related to the training they went through for the pathway. Um, so all just, again, trying to give you some information about the kinds of, of data that is being published, can be published, and what more would we want to know about some of these things. All right. Um, I am going to come to a close here soon so we can get on with your input. So Devin, you can close out of this and we can jump back to um, the Scott, slide deck. Yes. Tina raised her hand. Oh, thank you very much. It's the problem of trying to walk and talk at the same time. Tina, what, what can I help you with? So I was wondering if you could go to the tab that was on the left-hand side that says outcomes data just so that um, I could get a sense of the kind, do we ask specific questions that then direct the user for the type of outcomes data we want them to provide? And if so, is there, if we scrolled all the way down, a place where we would ask for this aggregated outcomes data by either population group or by um, uh, income area? So I, I wanted to ask that question on what prompts do we give our uh, colleagues as they're uh, inputting data around outcomes data? This is why Tina Gridiron is on the council because she gets right to the heart of the matter. This is perfect. Um, and, and I think the way to 
the way to answer that is to date, Credential Engine has not given those kind of prompts um, because as an organization that has been dedicated to making transparent whatever information a training provider or a state has about those credentials and competencies, um, we want to help them make it transparent. But I think the I think what we're doing now with this particular work, Tina, is thinking about with the set of recommendations we want to put forward, recommending what data we need and how to ask for that data, and mm -hmm. what and what are the characteristics of the of the data that we want. So perfect question. I think you're getting right to the heart of the matter. In order to really understand if this truck driver training program is equitable, we need those outcomes to be broken down and, you know, disaggregated by population and demographics and whatever else we need. Um, you know, and, and so our recommendations should begin to move not just to, hey, can you make this data transparent using CTDL, but in order to understand the equitable characteristics of that training, this is what we need you to share and broken down by these ways with these kind of categories. Um, so that is exactly what we want your help in helping us get to and then putting those recommendations together so we can be more proactive with our publishing partners. And in fact, with credential providers writ large period, what is it we need to know about what you offer in order to help people make more their most informed decision. Got it. Thank yes. you. Yes, no, you hit the nail right on the head. Not if I might, this is Bettina. Um, I also like, I, as an educational service provider, obviously we're very interested in the number of WIOA completers, exiters, right? But are the learners interested in that? I, I asked that myself that question, right? And I hearken back to gainful employment, right? Like the amount of effort institutions had to put forward to provide um, data related to our, you know, cost of attendance, completion, time to completion was very valuable for us as an institution. I wondered, and I continue to wonder how much that influences the learner as they're making their decisions. Right. I think there's other things that are probably a higher priority from a learner's perspective, um, at least based on my experience, right? The potential earning potential, job growth potential, time to completion is a big deal. Total cost of attendance, obviously. Um, yeah. No, that, that, that is perfect. And I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, th this is, I'm taking notes here um, it, mentally, but also I, I think we've got staff who are beginning to write these things down because. These are exactly the kind of things we want to understand. I, I do believe that both are important. At some point, we really want to help someone know that, oh, you know, the, the employment and the earnings is really high, but the cost to get there might, you know, kind of be a factor I take into account in my decision whether I go down that pathway or not. So um, you know, our, our mission ultimately is going to want to be to get all of that data in and then I think, Bettina, what you're hitting on is how do we help individuals be able to use those data in ways as they need it, when they need it, in ways they need it to make the best decision for themselves. And, and that's going to get into some student psychology and other things that you know, we'll, we'll sort through. Um, but you're absolutely right. There might be some things we do collect that a student's going to roll their eyes at and say, yeah, yeah but that, that's not what I care about. And we, we want to be able to capture all of that. Um, I saw also John um, asked the question, once the data points are entered, who will update? Um, so the answer in, in our work is that the owner of those data um, are responsible for the updating. And uh, one great example um, here is that, for instance, um, our colleagues at the Kansas Board of Regents use an API and we get updates on the information they have in the registry practically daily on anything that has changed in their systems, any updates they have flows into the registry. Um, Illinois is now using an API and we get massive updates daily 
Um, so the more we can uh, put in place those kind of systems to ensure that we're getting updates on a regular basis from whoever owns those data, whether it's the Indiana Board of Nursing, um, or if it's Ivy Tech, or if it's the you know, Illinois Central College, um, we want them to be the ones who are updating those data in the registry. Tamara, okay. I didn't know if you wanted to join in. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and please excuse my ignorance on this, but you know, I don't come from education and so I come from the world of, of employment and I'm wondering who is, like, is there an expectation that employers would be able to consume these kind of credentials in a way that tells me what skills gap that this could fill? Um, because I'm unclear on it, just reading through it. I, yes. So the, the goal is that um, employers would be able to have as much value out of all of these data as, as a student or policymaker. Um, it's probably going to come through uh, organizations that you work with um, who are providing uh, applicant tracking systems or HR management systems or you know, kind of forecast for what the um, uh, broader education and training system is able to provide in Corpus Christi or Kansas City or Memphis or wherever you happen to be, um, but that can look at these data and be able to report, here is what we see being offered in this region. Here's how it can line up with the employment needs. And, and those, those activities may or may not come from Credential Engine itself, but they, the data that's in the registry can be used and consumed by a burning glass or a work day or you know, someone of that nature who is taking those data and putting it into tools that benefit you where you sit in your organization um, the same way that we would expect the data to be used by Naviance or Futures or Geographic Solutions to serve students. And I know we've got some um, other Credential Engine folks on. So if, if anyone else wants to kind of chime in on, on some of those points. I see Deb and, and Emily have been putting some notes in the chat too. So feel free to, to chime in as well. All right, Devin, let's, um, let's move on. We can close out of this and then we can, yep, great, you're back to that. So the, the deck there, um, we don't need to go through all of these. I was just for when you get to the deck itself, when you, when you get that copy, you can just see I'm pointing out different tabs you might want to click on. Um, that we just went through um, as well. So you can just go through a couple of these slides, Devin. Yep. And one more. Okay. So those were all examples of um, the kind of outcomes that, that we can capture. The area that we freely admit we've not done as much work on in the CTDL um, are inputs. So there are some inputs that we do capture and some that were just mentioned by a couple of the um, participants today. Uh, we can capture information and do capture information about who's the intended audience. Is this for you know, undergrads? Is it for grad students? Is it for um, part-time, full-time? Uh, the delivery type, is it in-person or is it virtual? Important to know if you're trying to help design a pathway that people can take advantage of. Costs. Uh, I think Bettina mentioned time to complete. Um, that, that's a data element that can be published against in the, in the CTDL. What kind of quality assurance um, is out there? You know, back to the gainful employment. You know, do they really care about that? Is, you know, or is that, um, is that something that policymakers care about or are there other quality assurance uh, indicators that people will care about? Um, what kind of occupations and industries is the credential associated with? Um, what are the, how does this connection, how does this credential connect to other credentials? Is it something that you have to take in order to um, move on to the next thing? Is it something that provides advanced standing for something? Um, and I've just had in the circles here, um, in the upper right, you can see this AS in nursing does have information about what this credential is required for or provides advanced standing for. Um, what are the competencies that are part of it and the quality of assurance and then down on the, on the left-hand circle, information about costs and time to completion and other things. Again, not to say that what we have here is perfect. There may be some improvements as Tina was pointing out about disaggregation, but just to get you thinking about the kind of things we already cover. 
What we don't yet cover um, in the bottom left of this slide are really important things like, are there supportive services that are available at that institution that, were, that are designed to help in this individual students successfully complete? Um, are there career assessments that help people choose the right courses and the right pathways while they're there, depending on what their career goals are? Um, so that, that course selection. Are there regular counseling requirements so that we see you at the 15 credit, the 30 credit, the 45 credit hour, or you know, whatever the, the timing may be? And how would we capture that? What does that look like? Those are some of the things we know that we're missing um, and that we think are really important for describing pathways and transfer that we, we hope to get some of your input on as well. All right, am I missing any conversation points in the chat? Otherwise we can move ahead. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you some good ideas about what is in CTDL, the kind of things we can uh, describe and the things we want to be able to describe. So we're gonna send, send you off to um, a Miro board um, and we hope the Miro board works for everyone. Um, we, we debated whether we should use Padlet, whether we should use something else and we settled on a Miro board. Um, but if the Miro board doesn't work, just send us your ideas and chat and elsewhere and some of us can, can actively put those in. Uh, we really wanna encourage that this be an, an open brainstorming, no wrong ideas opportunity for input. We can worry about down the road, whether it fits within our schema or whether it's something, a you know, data point that is better um, made available by someone else. We're not gonna worry about that now. Um, so if we click through, um, Devin, uh, and again, just a reminder of the kind of things that, that we might wanna know more about. Um, I really wanna just get your, your thoughts on anything you can think of. So one more click through, Devin. Okay, so um, we'll put that chat and I'm gonna ask Devin um, to just put that chat or I can put that chat in the, the, um, in the, uh, the link to the mirror board there. Um, we have uh, five different boards that we've set up. Um, we're asking to just give us input on uh, what are some inputs related to pathways we need to know more about and we need to, in order to determine equity, what are some outcomes related to pathways and then again, inputs and outcomes related to transfer and recognition of prior learning. And then if you've just got thoughts that don't fit in one of those four, we just have an open board um, to have you uh, put anything you want to in there. So Devin, I think you can stop sharing and I'm gonna try and share again. If not, I may ask you to share the neuro board if you can do that because my sharing is actually not still working. Um, and uh, if we put the, um, yep, the link to the Miro board is in there. Um, and again, if the Miro board is not working for you, do not worry about it. Um, we can just send ideas to us. Um, but yeah, people are getting the idea here. Just grab one of the, the sticky notes on the side of each board, drag it into the board itself. Um, I and other staff here will just keep replacing the, the sticky notes so there's always plenty for people to use. And send us, you know, type in information about what are the data points we need? Where might we get it? What do we need to know about those data points? Is it a, a question of disaggregating? Is it a question of time? Is it a question of, you know, the, the uh, I have to know that the earnings and employment outcome is the most recent possible? Um, I only want to know it if it's for 12 months of outcome data. Um, so if anyone is, is having trouble navigating the Miro board, um, you can just scroll your, your mouse um, up and down to, to enlarge it. Uh, typically, if you use your right uh, clicker, you can um, drag the board around your screen to get to where you want to be. Um, and again, if you just hate the Miro board, let me know and, uh, and, and we, Devin, Deb, Emily, Scarlett and I can take your notes off of um, chat and, uh, and throw it in. And Any Scott, questions? The, the yes, Kristen. Other, the only thing I would add is that I know sometimes earlier when we're talking about outputs or inputs, 
yes. you can kind of conflate the two. We wouldn't worry about where you place them. We're really thinking about when you're building the pathway, what are the data points that help us to better understand what makes it equitable? We'll move them um, as, as needed. Um, and again, as he mentioned, if you can't use the mirror board, feel free to use the chat and someone will insert them for you. Or just call it out. Um, we, yeah. we really hope that the beauty about the mirror board is once it's on the mirror board, you, you can't tell, I don't think, who put it on. Um, so all ideas are welcome. Um, all input is, is welcome. We, we pre-populated a couple of things on here. I know there were a couple of council members who couldn't make um, today's meeting. And so they were putting a few things on themselves. Um, and so hopefully there's some, some good starting points for you all there uh, to, to think about. Scott, would you like me to screen share the mirror board or pause for right now on that? What do people think? Is, do people want the, is it helpful to be able to see it or do we want to just let people have it on your own screen? Why don't we just, because the mirror board to really see it, you need to be on one portion of it and not everyone's going to be on the same portion. Let's just leave it be for now for a second. Um, and what I would invite people to do is if, if you see something going on and you just have a question about it or you want to um, you know, ask for a little additional information about what someone was thinking. Um, I think we can just, uh, you know, ask ask those questions and query each other about what it is that we're we're tossing on here. Um, I'm also curious to see if people just like using the mirror board. We, we tend to use it a lot for um, designing uh, and mapping out some complex systems. And, and we've used it a lot as we're building out new UI and UX interfaces with our design team. Um, so we have found it useful, but you know we're a bunch of techie data nerds. I think after five and a half years, I'm allowed to call myself a techie data nerd too. I'm not sure if, if the tech team would allow me to actually do that, but I'm going to go for it and just own it. Does anyone have any questions about what you're seeing put in there yet? I'm not hearing any screams of existential angst and using the mirror board. So I'm going to take that as a good sign. I'm going to give everyone just like five more minutes and I'm going to start asking some questions that I'm, I'm curious about that are on the board. So there's a couple here that I, I'm just, I want to make sure we understand what people are thinking um, as, so we can, we can be thinking about how best to um, consider it for, for our work. And Scarlett, uh, Deb, and Emily, too, um, if you have questions, since you all live in the CTDL way more than I do, if you have questions about anything you're seeing here, um, please ask so we can take advantage of this time to make sure that we are we're clear on what folks are throwing in.
Yeah, so if I'm seeing some a lot of like blank um, sticky notes, all you have to do is just click on the sticky note if it's there and just type into it um, in case people are unsure about how to do that piece of it. How's everyone doing? We had... Thanks, Tina, if, if you've not left already. All right, I, I'm not sure, is everyone who's on the call, did you all come in before we posted the link to the Miro board? I just wanna make sure everyone knows where we're at in, the, um, in our process. Does everyone who's on right now have, have that link to the Miro board? Or are some people wondering why we're not having a slide presentation or any sort of other interactive process in a council meeting? I'll throw the mirror board in again, just to have it there. Carla and Devin reposted it, so we're good to go. Ah. I love this team. Right. It looks like we still have some really good activity going. Kristen, I'm curious, are there any questions you have about anything you're seeing put up here we want to we want to ask about? Yeah, well, I think everything looks really good. I was, I was just now in the recognition of prior learning. Um, and one of the things, and we'll probably talk more about this, Scott, is the culture aspects that sometimes also deem if a pathway can be equitable. And so people uh, or someone listed biases of faculty towards PLA. Um, so thinking about how we can capture that, I, I'm wondering if it's more so identifying inputs that help debunk those biases. Um, and, that, and I'm thinking there, so again, people should just be capturing their thoughts and then we can think about what do we really mean by that in a way that data can support it. Yeah, no, that, that is a, that is a, a great, um, you know, I, I think one of the things we came into this whole council conversation thinking about was, you know, are there certain, and it might be the bias of the faculty, but is there just generally culturally a bias of, um, you know, against certain types of credentials, you know, that, that some things aren't wor worth having, 
transfer value assigned to them. You know, that's that's for just kind of entry level jobs or you know whatever it may be. Um, and so we should probably have you know some sort of a policy around transfer, um, regardless of the credential. That there there needs to be recommendations um, or consideration for everything. Yeah, and I, I think I saw that in Equal Pathways where people are saying we're ensuring that all populations have access to all different types of credential and not just certain pathways for certain populations. Yeah, Emily, you, um, you came across something, some research that just came out the other day about, um, and I don't want to say it wrong, so I don't know if you're if you're able to come off mute and just, I forget what the research was you saw about implicit bias built into certain um, tools out there. Yeah, I will put a link in the chat because the scholars can do a lot better job explaining what they found than I can. Um, but it was really interesting uh, research coming out of Berkeley, I think, um, around uh, especially like online management platforms like Coursera and Ed2Go and those types of platforms that um, are replicating some of the uh, equity challenges that we see in some for-profit institutions, for example. Um, so I think it's emerging research, but it's interesting to think about how some of those for-profit platforms that are being used by nonprofit institutions might replicate some of those same um, inequities. Excellent. And John, I see, just so you know, I, I see your notes in the chat to me. We'll make sure that we get those um, captured and I can uh, respond to you separately just as well. Devin, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we'll capture all the chat, right? Yep. Yeah, sorry so, about that. No, no, that's, uh, I, I can't get my Zoom share to work today. So there's just, there's always gonna be something. Oh, so another thing that is resonating when we're looking at the prior learning outcomes, a lot of people are talking about that connection to career. Um, and so how do we help employers to better translate um, the credentials to job descriptions that recognize prior learning? So that's another thing, a theme that's standing out given our earlier conversation about how can employers use this? Yep. And one thing um, I don't know if, if Jeannie and I have, have talked about um, enough but you know, one of the things that, that CTDL supports is not just being able to describe the competencies uh, about a credential offering, but we can also publish the competencies and requirements, uh, skill-related requirements or credential-related requirements of job descriptions. So the ideal is that, say, in Alabama, will have information about their entire credential ecosystem, all the competencies, ideally their pathways and, and other things, but also as Alabama is finalizing their new industry competency frameworks, those will get published to the registry. So you'll be able to see not an actual job posting from a particular employer, but a, an occupation or industry framework that is more a little bit more generic you'll see the skills that are required in CTDL. So you can actually have a pure link between high school to community college, to certification, to higher ed, to, you know, to, to four year, to the actual job requirements of a particular occupation and see that all in real time in linked open data. Yep. And those are excellent. Um, I had a question, uh, if I could, just about in the inputs for um, uh, pathways, governance of the entity providing the education training pathway. Um, I just want to make sure I understand if the person is who wrote that is still on today. 
Um, does governance mean is it public or private institution? What 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 would it, was being meant by the by the word governance there, and, and what is it about the governance that you think is something we need to capture? I'm just I'm not sure I'm going to translate that into into CTDL. Uh, that was that was me, um, and I, I I feel like I was sort of open, but just thinking about sort of like who's making decisions about the program feels like a really important aspect around. Mm. Um, so I think public or private, um, if it is sort of you know private, if it's private nonprofit, like what does their board look like or their leadership? Private for profit, you know, I was thinking like that, or I, um, I've done some work on. Um, private for-profit colleges, but also like the, the sort of structure of it. So whether it's like publicly traded, venture capital, like mom and pop. Um, so I was thinking sort of like all those things, I don't know like what's possible to sort of like what's realistic to get, um, but that felt really, um, really important to capture. Awesome. No, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, some of those things we do, um, we can capture. Um, some we might want to just flesh out a little bit further. Um, so that's, that's exactly, you answered my question. Thank you. Do other people have questions for each other about what you're seeing here? Just would like a little clarification that will benefit both your understanding about what's on the board, but also might help um, you know, us think about this as we go back and, and look at all of this. We really do want to give you the chance to have a conversation with each other. Do you have any questions from you as you're looking at all this? Um, a couple of comments. One is that the way transfer value is defined in CTDL offers a broader range, a broad array of um, transfer explanations. So, you know, traditionally it's about is there a transfer value for this course to apply to a degree at another institution? And it covers that. But it also covers things like um, can this um, occupational training program or the CTE program be applicable for college credit or can it be applicable for the types of skills that are needed in a job? And so basically what it does is it takes all the power of CTDL and it lets you put that information in two sides of an equation in terms of evaluating the transfer value from this for that. And so I'm seeing some of the some of the comments um, in, implying that here, but I wanted to call that out as an opportunity that it may be that we just make that aspect of CTDL more more widely known and accessible to people to use. I think that that's a great point, Deb. Um, I am. I am keenly aware that you know we have we have not made um, we've not made the general uh, community of interest fully aware that we have 800 terms and here's what they all are and here's what they the value is and here's how to use them. Um, you know we've we have spent a lot of time building this this whole structure, and now we need to spend some time actually helping people understand what's in it and how to use it and the value of it. So. It's been a, it's a bit, been a bit of a chicken and egg. You have to make sure you have everything in there, um, but it doesn't matter if you have it and no one knows how to use it and the, the value of it all, so. Well, and I would love to see for that, um, for some sort of data about transfer rates um, and acceptance of prior learning as part of the um, characteristics of the institutions and programs, right? If we could have it be almost competitive that institutions um, want to be seen as having very high numbers of um, transfer um, applicate transfer and PLA applied to progress, um, 
That would be a great thing to see that ecosystem, as far as I know, really doesn't exist right now. The other thing I'll just quickly mention here um, for, for anyone who's on, uh, but also just for any of our publishing partners, uh, we are gonna be seeking um, some, some partners who want to help us you know, put some of these recommendations in place. You know, who out there would be uh, willing to work with us to have all of this rich information or as much of this information that you all are putting on these boards now um, who would raise their hand and say, yep, we, we believe in all of this and we want to do what we can to publish to the registry this level of information. So, you know, as Deb's pointing out, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, more information about the, the transfer? Um, so if, if any of the folks on the call who are publishing with us now who would like to say, yes, we, we would like to raise our hand and um, help to uh, demonstrate this um, and be the ones who can be a, a test case and a, and a showcase for how the rest of our publishing community should be um, stepping up, we would welcome that. And one of the one of the great things about the reusability and the linking of data in the registry is that once we get more people publishing transfer values, they're infinitely reusable. So if one institution wanted to say, yeah, we'll, we'll also take that transfer value, you could do that in bulk. Say for example, you had, um, you know, like say when Kansas publishes their military transfer values, and then if another state wanted to say, yeah, we also do what Kansas does, there are programmatic ways of doing that at scale to reuse the transfer values that have been defined by someone else. Excuse me. Um, Marty from Kansas is on with us and, and I will just tell you, Marty, that there are, and I think you know this from the state uh, partner calls, um, there's a lot of excitement to see what you all publish and um, not just from other states, but the Department of Defense is really excited about it. Department of Labor and Education are really excited about it. There's, there's a lot of organizations that can't wait to see you know, kind of what this all really looks like. No, no pressure, but you know. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, I think some of, of the organizations that um, are excited actually want to use the data. So, um, and they're hoping that once it's out there that they can consume it, which, which, you know, would be fantastic for us because we're getting these requests from, you know, different entities that they want the data. It's just complicated for us to provide the data in, in, a, in a format that can be consumed easily, um, which can be done with, with, with the registry. So we're excited about that. Something else that Kansas um, just recently approved is a, a common gen ed package. Um, it's gonna be implemented in fall 2024. And so we're, we're hoping at some point in time, that's something we can incorporate in the registry as well be fabulous. Yeah, I think Indiana is doing some of that work with us right now as well. Yeah, Scott, I would second uh, that comment from uh, Marty. I think in states where there are standard um, statewide transfer agreements, right, and, and, and those are widely accepted and implemented across the state, those could be huge leverage points for the portability of learning across institutions. Um, I, I really feel for us to get to a very, my word, aggressive place around uh, prior learning assessment, we really have to tackle some of the institutional barriers are, around, um, and I'm the one who put the faculty biases, or, or, because we're trying to push a pretty aggressive prior learning assessment agenda at the Maricopa Community Colleges, and we're met with significant resistance, so we've kind of had to adjust our strategy to recenter around industry recognized credentials, right? Because as professionals in those fields, they understand the value of those industry recognized credentials. And so can we start there, right? And, and have conversations about really changing the culture to be more accepting of that. And um, I think having them tackle some of their 
biases uh, that they unconsciously bring to the table, unconsciously in some cases, because nobody can teach it better than you, um, around why they're not open to that. Um, so I, I think including something like statewide transfer where it exists could be a huge uh, data point that could be very helpful in, in, in um, the porting. I know in the state of Arizona, we have it. I've been doing some work, some equity transfer work with AACC uh, in some states that don't have that in Michigan in particular. And I was very surprised at the amount of effort uh, that they have to put in as institutions to create those opportunities for yeah, and I will say, you know, I think um, the faculty issue is, is probably, you know, the same nationwide. Um, I mean, recently we we had an issue where faculty wanted to raise the AP scores, um, I think it was for English, um, which meant, you know, fewer students would be able to transfer that, that credit um, into our institutions. Um, luckily, it didn't pass, but it was something that the faculty was pushing and then, you know, we kind of pushed back on. But, you know, part of our goal is to get students, you know, graduated on time, because that's going to make it more affordable. I mean, it just it just makes sense to you know, really push credit for prior learning, transferability as much as possible um, to make that a reality for our state. So this is Rob. Uh, I, I always t I always think that in when I talk to like my friends who and I you know, I'm now in my mid thirties and I have a lot of friends who have like a little bit of college or a little bit of a credential. And I, I think the most underutilized thing in the world is reverse transfer, right? By institutions and by individuals. And I kind of put this, but like one of my kind of pie in the sky things would be credential, if we could match, and this is hard because it, it requires, there isn't necessarily a uniform thing, right? You, most institutions get to determine if they want to do any reverse transfer at all, you know, often it's only towards other academic institutions, but to this idea of credit for prior learning, like in a perfect world, in addition to, to getting a credential, any credential doesn't just improve your workforce opportunities, but theoretically it opens up pathways to other credentials. And in the best case scenario, it sh lengthens the time and the cost of acquiring other things, right? And so, you know, I'd be really interested if there is any way, um, if for example, you know, uh, an IT certification in a certain state, right? Um, if there's any part component of that, that might be recognized towards like an associates towards computer science or IT or data science would be recognized by an institution near them. Cause that could be, um, like an important thing, right? If I said, hey, wait a minute, if there's a train, if there's, if I could do a six week Google data course, right? And get this IT certification, right? Um, or an AWS thing, because there's some sort of cloud data thing that I want to do. Oh, and by the way, Montgomery County Community College in Maryland will treat that, will give me X amount of credit hours towards that. That could, that would be like an important thing for folks, right? Because it shortens and decreases the cost of that pathway. Um, so uh, there just is a thing to build on this idea of how, how different folks may be use information about how different folks may be awarding prior learning as recognized by, you know, action. And the deck, the negative side of this is when you don't have this, uh, I was working with teacher cert certification programs, folks, folks who, who work with teacher certification programs in uh, Baltimore City. And one of the nightmares of some of them is that uh, if you start yours at an ins at a institution uh, and you don't finish it and you want to transfer to another institution, they'll usually take your credits. But some of the um, alternative certification programs which you pay money for, will not accept your credits and people don't know this necessarily. And so if you don't complete, you know, you have to start from the beginning. And of course you get no reimbursement for that. And when I hear that on the back end for folks with certain institutions, it's like, man, no one should enroll in that and <laughs> should, en should enroll in that, right? Um, but people don't know that until they, they, they're like, well, you know, I, I didn't meet the requirements for that one to finish, but now I have to start all over. Now I have to start all over again. So. 
We've actually um, gotten into some fairly deep discussions about um, licensure requirements and the, um, the consumer protections for informing students before they enroll in programs about exactly what you're talking about. Um, because it's, it's very complicated and there's very little education um, available to people to help them understand that. Rob, I'm hoping you captured all of that in one of the posts on the Miro board. Hey, I have a quick comment on um, both Bettina and Robert were, were mentioning. <clears throat> in my experience with PLA, it really and truly, in some of the pushback that we received when we implemented policies years ago, was really the key is to demonstrate the match of the student learning outcome. So if you can demonstrate that someone has um, obtained a mastery of skill and you can demonstrate that it matches the student learning outcomes of a course, it's kind of difficult to argue that they should be able to attain college credit for that mastery of skill. Do you follow? Yep. So I think if, if you keep that in mind, anybody who's having that pushback, keep that in mind, that demonstration becomes really important. And if you can showcase that, um, it becomes easier to, to map it out. Yeah, and I think for, in at least in our case, right, um, this also ties back to something I had put in around the structures that, that will support the acceptability, your policies, that kind of thing. Um, in, in the whole kind of flow of uh, accepting and evaluating prior learning. Um, if your institutional practices give first right of refusal to the faculty, which is in my case, um, I'm, I'm challenged by that, right? And need to begin to shift our thinking around our policy practices and procedures to be more equitable and more um, open and to consider other ways of, of evaluating. I apologize, Deb. Some of us only have, I only have um, active speaker on, so I can't see everybody. John, please, yeah, see, yeah. jump on you again. Go ahead, John. Um, I, I hope this is, that's maybe helpful. Um, in, in Scotland, when we um, made a big deal out of uh, credit transfer, and education institutions were entirely behind that, but they had a very particular uh, take on it, which is slightly worrying, but it's turned out to be really very helpful. And that is that every qualification within our framework, and you could say within the credential engine, has a credit value, which is a kind of average amount of time that you have, volume that you might, you might expect to spend on it. And that is only seen as uh, what you might call an upset price. So if you take it along to another college or university or whatever, you seek credit, then they will match that with the needs, as it were, for the course that you're trying to get into. And they may give you a full number of credits, or they might give you less than that and explain why and what you need to do to make up what's what's missing. You know, As I say at the time, that seemed terribly discriminatory and, and concerning. But actually, it's, I think it's worked very well because an assumption there now that you will look into the, the issue of credit, you will give credit if, if possible, but there's no implication that you just have to accept anything. It's, it's open for negotiation for the good of the institution, but also obviously for the learner who doesn't want to act on something with inflated credit value and then find that they can't actually finish. The sort of thing. There's a kind of pragmatism there and I, just, I, I work a lot in, in Europe, obviously, and, and uh, a lot of countries there have a much narrower view of how credit works. And because of that, they don't really introduce it. They, it hasn't become widespread. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of <laughs> our institutions and, and the pragmatism they showed in introducing that. Thank you. Um... Other, other thoughts, reactions, comments, 
questions about anything you see on the board or not on the board? Can't thank you enough for just this really rich outpouring of information and thoughts. You've given us a lot to work with. But I don't want to. I didn't. I didn't know if whoever had listed the comment um, around transfer and Deb, I see you have your hand raised um, about potentially creating um, cartels. I was just trying to understand if if you were saying that there's a fear that the data could create silos in the work, or just more clarity around that would be helpful if you're willing to divulge whoever listed that the transfer cartel comment. Well, Deb, you can go ahead. Your hand raised. Um, I mean, I just wanted to note that a lot of the outcomes posts or pathways are about the jobs and the earnings. And I think that that's an important acknowledgement that for many people, maybe most, the equitable outcome of education and training is is the, the job or the career advancement is not necessarily the completion of the credential. I mean, there was there was a word in the in the equity definition about completion, and um, I'm not saying that completion isn't important, but I am saying that I think you could have completion rates, and if you didn't also have um, data about um, employment outcomes and earnings, then you could be not addressing the, the goals of you know, why people are actually investing their time, energy, money in those programs. Yeah, and, and I think that's right. And I think that that came up in our last meeting, which is why we added that language around outcomes um, that's much more broader than just completion. So I, yeah. I think we tried to capture that. Good. All right, well, we, um, I never like to have to have a meeting last the full two hours. We don't need the full two hours, um, but I do want to just make sure we also don't cut off any additional conversation or, or input um, short. So maybe Scott, as people are still thinking through if there's anything additional we help and share, um, that the mirror world will still be open, right? For them to be yes. able to go in and add additional thoughts. Um, and again, we're looking for just a brain dump of anything you think would be helpful to looking for us to be able to identify for both data users um, and then um, on the back end providers to think about creating these equitable um, pathways. Our next step will be trying to make sense of everything and framing up some things, just like we do with the definition, for you all to review and get feedback on. Um, Elena, I see your hands raised. So. Thanks for the for the update, and I don't want to keep us longer, as I'm sure folks would welcome time back. And I think it's just been a productive meeting. Um, Will there be engagement? Uh, like it's a general question around engagement with learners. Um, so I, speaking for myself, um, I work for a state government agency. And so like, I have a very particular lens that I am bringing into this conversation. And so that's not quite the lens of like a learner, right? Like, or the, the intended user, although there's multiple intended users. And so I'm just wondering, will there, or, and I might've missed this, be conversations with learners or focus groups to see how they're, um, whether or not we're capturing the type of information that they would want as they engage with the tool? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, let me, I don't think there's ever an easy way for me to answer any question because this is all just so complex. Um, so, just as a reminder, you know, we're not building the tool that 
learners would actually engage with, right? We're just, we're trying to make sure all the, the data layer is complete and fully open and, and accessible. So what we'll do is want to make sure that the organizations that use the data in tools that learners experience are making the changes. The risk, and, and I think you're right to raise this, is that those instant those organizations that use the data to serve students may not always be motivated to change how they operate in ways that you know really are getting to what we want them to get to. And so I do think um, we're going to have to engage students ourselves so that we can take the message back, not only that the outcome of the council was X and we need you to change how you have your data systems and, and tools and platforms structured, but that we've talked to students and they need the information differently as well. And here's what they need. And here's where you can find it in CTDL. And here are the standards we're gonna hold you. We're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, Credential Engine doesn't have an enormous, you know, um, bully pulpit but we do have the, the, the moral <laughs> argument on our side of. Well, you have a lot more data than anyone else. So thanks for the, the refrain, like the, the fact that you hold so much is a pretty big bully <laughs> pulpit though. I get your, I get your point and it is, um, I guess the part of what I'm getting at is collecting what folks will ultimately want to share with yep. students and whether or not um, we've captured all of that. Um, and I'm, I'm just not fully sure that I know, I don't engage with students enough. It's something that we're, we're trying to actually figure this very specific piece out in Massachusetts. And we just launched our strategic plan to so don't hear me a lot because I'm processing all of the stuff that's being, being shared. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I just want to make sure that this is ultimately going to be a value to the folks who we need it to be a value for, which is students. Um, and it's a yes. lot of information. So really appreciate again. And I just want to give a shout out to the credential engine team for the Miro board. I know most of the advisory council members probably spend dozens of hours on Zooms and are on other councils. I've never gotten to use Miro before. And it's always a challenge to figure out how to make virtual Zoom meetings engaging. Um, and so just appreciate the creativity there and wanted to give the team a shout out. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we went back and forth a fair bit and weren't even sure that this was gonna work. So glad to, glad to hear that it did. Um, Denifu, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. I did just wanna say, um, Elena, you know, we've had this conversation with Gates um, about you know, this portion of the, of the gathering, what kind of data do we think needs to be uh, provided and made public is the easy part. It's the next piece of really understanding the student needs and how to have that data be presented in ways that are of benefit and then hold those, those companies to account in changing their data systems and their, their offerings. That's gonna be the harder part. And um, Gates is very aware that we might need to have some additional work done around that. Um, and it's probably gonna be iterative. We, we have this information, we can show it to the students, they tell us what they like and what else they want. We come back and we are constantly working with, you know, a couple of vendors who, who want to be piloting this so we can show the, the, the best, um, best practice uh, out there. So you're, you're absolutely right on board. You're, you're right on top of it. Uh, Denifa, did you, is your hand still up? Did you go away? Did I miss you? Uh, I was actually going to add to to something that Elena just said, and and I first of all I echo her comments about the mural board and just kind of being able to brain dump all the ideas. I think the thing that I continue to think about is that we talk very highly about the the outputs, um, well the outcomes without all the specific outputs that get us there. And so when Elena talks about the students. I'm not so sure, even though it's extremely important to uh, cross check all these ideas with what the students say they want. But if you're a first gen student or anything, you don't necessarily even know what you should be asking. And so I think the structural reforms at an institutional level are a core component of this that I haven't heard as much about. And I mean, we immediately fall into the um, competencies aligned with you know, aligned with workforce needs, but not all of the structural pieces that happen in a student's life cycle that will inform that. 
everything from when you recruit a student to enrollment process to first year experience to um, you know and I think we've talked about advising but you know how we're seeing this more integration between career advising and academic advising and so when I think about all those things I think there are some things that institutions can do and we probably have a lot more influence than we realize to encourage them to do those things um, we just don't have a lot of great examples of institutions, that, or maybe we have, we're not magnifying those great institutions that are doing it well. Now that 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 is that those are great points, and and makes me think that part of our work, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about the as you say the credentials and the competencies, but we probably need to go back and really have a complete refresh of what it is we're asking for about the institution. So the provider in, in, our, in our terminology, what more do we need to know about their culture, their governance, their structures, their support systems, um, which is as important in, you know, we're named credential engine, so, but, and we can't get too caught up with just worrying about the thing. It's the environment that you're earning the thing in and participating in to get that, that's right. All right, I have to go back to Gates and ask for even more money now. Well, and I also think part of this process is making sure we don't reinvent the wheel. So, you know, I'm learning just as much through these conversations and I'm trying to figure out how they align with, you know, our focus at Complete College America on those structural reforms. So we just put out a publication called No Middle Ground, which is about like, what are the tactics that go into equitable outcomes around mm. students' purpose, structure, momentum, and support? I'll drop the link in the chat, but I'd love to talk about how the work aligns. I would love to as well. Yes, no, that's great to know about that report. There is so much really good work going on in this space right now that just trying to stay on top of it all and make sense of it all and pull it all together. Um, yeah, and from the very beginning, we knew that we were not the, the experts in this space and that there was so much we needed to learn. So having you all help us with this and having HCM help us with this has been just fabulous. All right. So um, I've mentioned that we are absolutely looking for some organizations, some institutions or states or systems who want to raise their hand and say, we'd love to explore how far we can go in meeting the recommendations that are going to be coming out about making data available and, and what data that is. Um, we're also looking for some of the those companies, those platform providers who use the data and make it accessible to students and workers and others um, who would also raise their hand and explore with us what it would look like to change their systems to use data better and to serve students better. So if anyone has thoughts about who we might want to go to, um, A, thoughts about who would want to come to us <laughs> and raise their hand, but if not that, who would we want to go to and say, we, we think that you're ideally positioned to really test this out. Scott, can I ask you a really technical question? From a state perspective, do you do batch work? with like state systems and institutions rather than like institution by institution. And now I'm getting like really technical, but I'm just saying like the logistics of working with systems that yep. I've heard you mention so many other systems in the conversation that I'm just assuming that that's there and operationalized. Yes. Um, so a, cu a couple of answers to that. Uh, one, we will work with anyone you know, from a, a small certification body to an individual institution, um, to a full system, to a state, anyone who raises their hand and says, we want to publish. Uh, our, the most focus for us has been on working with states and publishing the data that states hold about the various credentials. Um, and I'll give you an example in a second. Um, and then increasingly we're engaging in efforts to have the combination of the states and the institutions publishing complementary approaches to, to what each of them hold. So Kansas um, has been our, our longest API provider 
where the Board of Regents publishes all the data they have about you know, what they hold on the, the public um, institutions in the state. And Marty, correct me if I'm going astray here, um, but right now the public two and four year institutions are published um, uh, on a regular basis and it's everything that they hold about, about mm -hmm. those you know, providers and credentials. Um, we're just about to, in, in the work we're doing in Texas, for example, uh, we'll be publishing the data that we that the higher ed coordinating board, so so post secondary, the Texas Workforce Commission, so the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act uh, uh, credentials, and the Texas Education Agency. The, we'll be publishing all the data they hold on the credentials in those three areas of their of their agencies. But then we'll also be working individually with institutions to add to the data that the institute that the state doesn't hold. You know, so the state, as you know, holds X amount of data for oversight and reporting and, and funding purposes, but it's not nearly 800 data terms. So we'll be working with the institutions in Texas to add a lot more data. And that's really where we're getting at with some of this work is we can't expect Kansas or Texas or you to ask for 800 data fields but we can say to the institutions between you and the state, we can get a lot more in that'll really benefit students in helping them understand the equity here. Yes, and, and um, Emily just offered um, to, to work with you and the state um, there to, to do that batch publishing, whether it's API or bulk upload or whatever works best, we can do both. Yeah, I won't add too much to what Scott already said, but um, just wanted to say hello and happy to chat more. And what we do is sort of figure out what data do you already have and what's the best way to publish that and, and how can we enhance that potentially to meet your goals. So happy to chat more. Okay. I'm sensing Kristen that it might be time to say thank you to this wonderful group for all of this amazing input um, and let folks have some time back. I think so. I think you all have given us a lot of good thoughts to work with and to build out. So looking forward to doing a deep dive. We will be in touch before September, but hope everyone enjoys their summer um, and look forward to being back as a full group in September. Indeed. Um, so if no one has anything else, Thank you all so very much. It's always been a pleasure. I love working with you all. Um, really appreciate your commitment to this work. And we will talk to you all soon enough. Thanks, everyone. Take care.